hello friends today we are going to deal with Foster's mm, the other boat it's a longish short story not exactly a novella um, published along with his other stories in life to come now one of the things that happens with this with this particular collection of Foster is these are stories that were published posthumously after Foster's death just like Morris's one of the reasons why um, it was published after Foster's death is not just because it was found among his manuscripts but these are stories that Foster did not want to publish during his life as in one sense they tended to veer towards what was we viewed as the abnormal. Now what was this that, that we term as the abnormal according to Foster and mainly what is it that we term as abnormal in the Edwardian era that Foster basically was uh, writing for generally even though he was writing for much longer he is someone who has rooted, rooted in that kind of Edwardian notions that come through in his works. Now, if if we are saying that these are works, uh, you know, these are, there are stories in life to come in one sense, show Foster as someone who is far more modernist rather than as generally recognized than, than generally um, recognized by critics because critics keep pushing him as someone who is almost late Victorian in the way he perceived things whether it is in where angels were to treat or or, um, or in a passage to India the Edwardian notions that come through now that's one part of what what happens with this particular publication along with Morris which were published after uh, Foster's death but along with it um, in these publications and these stories we also see another facet of Foster and the homosexual the stories will show whom uh, characters grappling with homosexuality which become a, a major theme in these stories now that's one part of it however that's not what is really interesting about these stories though that aspect itself has been um, dealt with by critics by and large because that becomes the ma major concern as to how why Foster did not actually publish them during his lifetime one and secondly while he did not publish them during his lifetime what why was he trying to um, or what kind of political claim was exist existed at that period that stopped him from publishing stories the short protagonists grappling with homosexuality that's the other part of it but this this particular story, hmm, the other boat, is not just about homosexuality, but there is also um, there is also a story about British imperialism. That's one of the things that Foster is doing here, and we also have certain traits of autobiographical elements that that we do find in the story. How does Foster actually combine these three elements? How does he show his protagonist grappling, grappling with? homosexuality, how does he show these characters um, struggle with the British imperialism that was present and whether what Foster felt about British imperialism, what Foster felt about the um, colonization, these are things that become a major part of this particular story. In the, sense, in the sense the story becomes far more significant because it is raising questions which then go on from being something that starts with the personal to the to the kind of questions that are generally marginalized to finally to questions that are that are universal in nature that are that almost for, for any post-colonial reader far more significant because how, how does Foster view this imperialism and what exactly is he speaking about now what I contend is that I mean these whether uh, this homosexuality that the protagonists are grappling with or this post-colonial notions or the, or the colon or what he speaks about colonization and imperialism that become a part of the story how both are interlinked in such a manner that you can't actually deal with one without speaking about the other this is what I contend and Foster managed to convey this how does he do that now, how does he do that it becomes really interesting first and foremost a, a quick uh, summation of the story we are not really going into details to summary the major characters in the story are Lionel and Coco Bonnet, two characters Lionel along with his siblings and his mother Mrs. March is uh, at the beginning of the story is traveling from India to England 
uh, on a ship and Foster insists on calling it a boat. We'll get back to why he keeps insisting on it as a boat, but um, are traveling on a ship to England and on this journey, on this voyage, um, there is also this boy who is whose origins are relatively ambiguous. Foster keeps the keeps calling him a half caste. What he means by half caste, not so much uh, from the perspective of a Hindu or an Indian notion, but half caste in the sense that he is of mixed breed. His is probably a, a suggestion that. Um, uh, first is speaking about how there is this young boy who has more than a touch of the tar brush. This is how Foster actually describes him. Now when he says he's a touch of the tar brush, what you mean is he's someone who is not as fair as this Caucasian boys <coughs> or or Mrs. March or or any of the other uh, other passengers on board, but rather someone who is darker in color. Not necessarily a black, please, not necessarily brown, but a touch of the tar brush. Sometimes he says more than a touch of the tar brush. But the, at the various points of the story, he is also ref, uh, referred to as a wog and as also someone who, when he is sleeping on the sheets, the color might come off on the sheets. The, these are the various kind of racist remarks that become a part of the story. But Foster never actually tells us as to whether this boy is is an African, is a boy, is, um, is a nation, or whether this boy is... Uh, what is what are the origins of this boy? So these are the bo these are uh, the passengers, and they're traveling together. Coconut, who's a young boy, b is befriended by Lionel and his and his siblings, and they start playing various games. Which Miss Mrs. March, that is Lionel's mother, is not really happy about. Mrs. March recently had. Um, suffered what you might term is a tragedy in her life in the sense that her husband um, Cory March had gone native in the sense that he had actually uh, got attracted to a Burmese woman and had left her and she is returning to England we don't know whether Cory March had gone native and has stayed back in Burma where he had finally settled but what we do see is this tragedy is something that Mrs. March is trying to come to terms with. She's also um, disgusted at one level as well as um, she's scandalized by what has happened in, in India, in, in, in Burma and in India. And then she, she is moving to England along with her children. So she's not really happy about the fact that the children are befriending a boy who is not a pure white boy. Now, uh, that's one part of the story, the beginning of the story. Now, after 10 years, the story then goes on for most quickly 10 years later when uh, Lionel is, a, uh, is now in the um, <coughs> now working for the crown and one of the things that uh, Lionel is asked to do as Lionel is moving to India and Lionel while he, as a young man wants to move to India he finds it difficult to find a berth on a ship to India. The name of the ship becomes interesting here we'll get to the name of the ship again Foster insists on calling it boat is called the SS Normania that um, Lionel finds himself on and he manages to find a berth on this boat on this particular ship thanks to Coconut, who meets him and who managed to actually get him a berth. But then uh, Lionel realizes that he is supposed to be sharing a cabin with um, Coconut, and yeah, while they are sharing this cabin, Coconut makes various overtures, sexual overtures, and they start having a homosexual relationship. Foster is um, it's slightly prudish in the way he depicts this particular relationship using mainly symbols and suge uh, suggesting it in various ways which um, which show um, while, while using what you might term as poetic imagery but rather what happens is most of these um, incidents homosexual incidents that you have happen off stage or are described in such a manner that the reader would not consider it as an erotic or a pornographic story please but what you do have here on the other hand is um, Lionel who is at the end of the story realizes that 
their relationship is something that others had figured out, others on the ship had figured out, murders Coconut and commits suicide and the story ends. Um, we are quickly concluding the story because um, there are other minor incidents that happen where Lionel sends a letter to his mother, Coco Wanet promises to see to it that the letter never reaches the mother but which actually reached the mother so that she has a pretty clear idea of what might have happened on the ship. These are things that we do know about the story. That's the story in brief. I'm not really doing justice to all the themes that Foster deals with as a part of the story but the things that really interest me are well Superficially, the story seems to suggest a young man trying to come to terms with his sexuality and horrified on finding that he is something who goes against what you term as the idea of the normal because he does not want to be viewed by the crew, viewed by the others, others other Englishmen who are traveling to India um, and to be then either losing his job and finally finding himself in the employment of coconut or any of these things, these are things that Lionel is horrified at. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what could be the reason? Of course, whom its value was frowned upon. This was this was a story that um, that pretty much comes in the wake of what had happened to Oscar Wilde. Uh, this is a story, though it was published in 1970, was something that uh, Foster had been working on for more than a, something like 30-40 years. That was the story that was with him. There are suggestions that this story, the first part, was uh, attempted somewhere in 1930-1914. That's a long time ago. And then again in 1948-1950. So this was a story that Foster kept picking at. We don't know when he completed it because it was only published after his death then so we don't know the, the exact date when the story was completed. But what we do know is these are concerns that, has, that stayed with him throughout his life. These are concerns that he was seriously thinking about throughout his life and the main question that Foster is trying to ask here is what do you mean by normal? We had spoken earlier about how the ship that Lionel travels by, travels on um, from England to India is called SS Normania. The name Normania in one sense hints at what is termed as normal. Normal no, and a play on normal Britannia. It seems to be a clubbing of these two words as the critics suggest. But what you understand by this if you say that there's normal Britannia what do you mean by this is it is something that that's far more troubling because when we look at the realist novel and realism per se you know the 19th century end of the Victorian era the tradition one thing that immediately comes to mind is that these are novels that dealt with the with the normative with what is termed as normal what is termed as as most probable in other words so the the real in one sense becomes what is most probable rather than real as something which is actually happening i hope that's clear when we say that the real is something that is uh, or or the real in the realist novel is about what is most probable rather than what is actually happening what we mean is there are certain things which had been marginalized certain incidents certain events which would be push it to the edges, push, push it to the margins, push it, would be mm, left uncovered for the simple reason they were not common. Now what were these things that um, were marginalized? One of the things that we speak about is, we speak about in the normative notions of the 19th century of, of Victorian era is that the normal Briton or the, or the normal Englishman is someone who is white who is along with being white in color is also by, perceived as someone who is honest, has integrity, he is also someone whose dealings were always considered as above board. That's one part of it. But this consideration that he had integrity also resulted in how he perceived something such as sexual intercourse. He would be perceived as someone who would who is only uh, interested in heterosexual relationships because that is considered as normal. 
the normative being heterosexual you are speaking about the white as someone who would be uh, indulging in sexual relationships which would only result in reproduction rather than anything else and and that uh, understanding of sexual relationships made heterosexual relationships as as the normative now that's one part of what the victorians did with this now why was it significant for them why was it necessary for them it becomes necessary as foster shows is because you are looking at the occident the occident or the west or these whites as being a foil to the orients to the asians uh, to the so, so that the colonizers were viewed as someone who were who are foils to the to the natives who they could colonize it seemed that as the colonizers as the white the Euro europeans be, uh, had a culture which mm, which showed them as being pure not just in color but also in the kind of character they had and in this purity of character they equated it with heterosexual being heterosexual they viewed the orient as someone who dealt with various underhand things and one of the underhand things that they would that they attributed to the orient is that they are they are also homosexuals or bisexuals now why do we say this that they were homosexuals or bisexuals or sly or what various other adjectives that are given to orients now uh, this is something that foster knew about i mean a, a kind of knowledge or a kind of uh, uh, belief that existed in the victorian era which foster was drawing upon how was he drawing upon this in the victorian era when when we read how richard burton for instance richard burton spe speaks of the sotadic zone foster is referring to the sotadic zone where he describes the geography of the era area that the ship goes by and that's one of the things that Foster pay, plays uh, close attention to, and right through the story, he plays close attention to the various ports, various places that they were actually crossing in the ship. For instance, in the first part of the journey, we'll get to the Saturday soon in a minute. But the first part of the story, when um, um, when we are having Lionel and Coco one are traveling uh, along with Mrs. March. To England, he speaks about how the sun was shining brightly on the ship. One of the first things that he says. Now, what is this sun that he's referring? He's referring to the sun that is the British Empire, that was still shining, that was still flourishing in one sense. But this symbol, in one sense, also becomes far more significant in the second half of the story, in the sec, in the later parts of the story, where we see while they're traveling, one of the things that happens is as uh, Lionel moves away from England, he loses power. He feels his energy sapping slowly. Now, what does he mean by that? We are speaking about Lionel who, when they left England at the beginning of the journey, along with Coco, that is someone who is shown as being really strong, being in control of his emotions, uh, being someone who is who had strong faith in, in, in the kind of world or in the way he perceived the world. But as the story moves forward, he's also someone who's shown as losing control over his emotions, losing control over his own actions, he's allowing Kokova not to take control over him as they move towards the Orient. That's one thing that happens. The second thing is the Swatadic zone that we spoke of. If you remember the uh, homosexual experiences, the incidents that happened between Kokova Nat and Mm, Lionel happen only after they go past Gibraltar. The zone from which you say that the Sotadic zone starts according to Burton. And the Sotadic zone according to Burton is a place where human minds or human humans in that particular place are really weak. They do not have control over themselves. Their bestial instincts take over in one sense. For Burton, this justifies why we have to colonize these natives because these natives this these people who are from the sotadic zone and and the orient cannot really constrain their control their bestial instincts and the europeans have to rule over them rule over these natives and train them so that they behave in what is termed as a normal manner 
so there is a homogeneous culture that you are trying to uh, make the natives accept by suggesting that their culture is inferior moreover suggesting that the natives culture is bestial that the natives culture is something that is also uncanny as Foster points out not that Foster believed that the natives culture is uncanny but he is basically critiquing a certain world uh, way of viewing the world at, in, 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 when he was writing this story of how people how the Europeans perceived the natives. <laughs> now, if that's one part of what happens with this journey that uh, Lionel and Coco wanna take on the Normania, slowly the normal Britannia, at the part of the real world or the or what is termed as the normal, is something that it comes under the scanner because if Lionel is viewed as a representative of normal Britannia. A normal Britannia speaks about someone who is who is a heterosexual male, is a virile heterosexual male, who would go on to actually colonize other nations so that they, uh, he who can help the empire build itself. What happens to this virile uh, young male? Remember, Lionel is also a representative of what you term as the muscular Christian. Now, the muscular Christian from the notions that you would uh, that are obvious for those anyone who has read Tom Brown School Days is is about young boys who went to public schools and were trained in a certain way of life in England in the in the, in the 19th century and the in the in the basic um, understanding is these young boys were not only physically fit so that they were strong they could they were also mentally and morally strong three things. Now, what do we mean when we say that they were physically, mentally and morally strong? They were physically strong because they had to face the various hardships when they went to these various colonies, whether in Asia or Africa or America or Australia, wherever that they were forced to go. One of the things that the young men, um, these young boys had to be was they had to be physically fit to withstand this um, the hardships that they would that they were mostly most likely to face in these worlds that's one part of it but along with being physically strong they have to be mentally strong because quite often they would be challenged where they might they might have bouts of despair they might be um, become desperate where they might have to um, become homesick these are things that they have to actually cha these were challenges that um, that they they have to uh, remember so that he's while they will not uh, actually have someone that they can draw upon that they can ask for support they have to draw upon themselves their own resources so that they have to be mentally strong but thirdly along with being physically and mentally strong they also had to be morally strong so that a strong grounding in christian morality becomes significant for them because so that they do not go on and change their religion, change their faith, change their understanding of of who or what was God or what was required now or what their morals were. Why was the third part really significant? The third part is really significant because one of the justifications that the colonizers came up with when they were colonizing these various nations, colonizing this or um, taking over various nations was that not only were they improving their lives, but they were saying that they were bringing religion to them, bringing God to them, the real God to them in Christianity, the real religion to them. And by bringing the real religion, the reason why they said that this was a, the real religion or the or the God who was really kind and considerate in, in contrast to the gods that <coughs> the Asians and Africans prayed to or worshipped is because they viewed these Asian and African gods as pagan gods, heathen gods who encouraged uh, brutality. Let us for a moment forget about the uh, how whether it makes whether it was this rhetoric. Um, it is rhetoric. Whether this rhetoric really makes sense, but this is a rhetoric that they had to actually uh, sell to the natives. And for them to be able to uh, get this rhetoric across to the natives, what they had to do was, 
first of all have individuals, the soldiers or missionaries who are going to these various colonies strongly believe in this. If the, if the soldiers, the European soldiers or the European missionaries or the European officers were not really convinced by this, what would happen to them is that they might go native. Yes, we have an example in the story of something of this sort happening right at the very beginning where Lionel's father had gone native. In a, and the reason why Lionel's father is viewed as someone who had brought disgrace to the family is because he had gone native in the sense he had betrayed uh, the empire, he had betrayed this whole Christian religion, he had betrayed a whole race in, by going native, by actually making them feel that it's impossible for a person to actually have a relationship with a native woman. That's what Lionel's father has done. Remember, Lionel's mother, Mrs. March, is someone who traces her ancestry to the War of the Roses. She is either from the Lancashire or Yorkshire sect. But what we see from this is someone who is proud of her lineage, but also someone who is actually a part of the ruling class, an aristocrat. Now, along with being a, uh, an aristocrat, one of the things that we know about March is March becomes a representative not of the Edwardian mother, but actually the Victorian mother, probably even Queen Victoria in one sense. How does she become that? In the story, Lionel, when he writes a letter to his mother, address her as matter. Now, there's a French form of address, but far more importantly, there's an archaic form of address. An archaic form of address that Lionel comes up with, and this archaic form of address also shows that his mother works in an archaic manner. Her principles are archaic, her ideas are archaic, her way of viewing the world is completely archaic. But what does this archaic mean? This archaic also is also a period considering when the story is written and when the story is set of of the Victorian era where Britain could easily justify ruling over the rest of the world because they felt they were morally superior. They felt they were morally superior and had the kind of authority where Britannia could actually rule over the rest of the world by using this culture saying that it was the normal culture, saying that it was something that um, that others had to look up to. But if this was what Britannia was supposed to be, uh, this was what, uh, this was the kind of culture that um, Mrs. March actually uh, represents. Remember what happens to this particular culture when Lionel starts having a relationship with Coco Walnut. It's, a, it's something where Lionel starts questioning. Lionel is, is shocked at himself, and, but that first and foremost that he had gone against what is termed as the normal behavior. That's one part of it. He's not really a willing accomplice right from the very beginning. A willing partner in this sexual interludes is, is more that he is, he is in one, one sense seduced by the various bribes that he gets from Coco Warnett, but along with the bribes, he starts uh, falling really in love with Coco Warnett. Remember, he speaks about how it's only with Coco Warnett that he can actually converse, that he can have a conversation, something that he can't have with most most people, That's even with Isabel. Now, the reason Lionel is saying this is he has found someone who he feels understands him who he feels is willing to have a conversation with him. But at the same time, he's revolted by the fact that he is going against a certain notion of what is supposed to be normative. This becomes traumatic for Lionel, naturally. Now, while it becomes traumatic for, for Lionel, he's also struck by the fact that he is what you might term as a hypocrite. Because he's a hypocrite in the sense, below deck he goes and he actually has a relationship with um, with Lionel, uh, with with Coco Warnett. And then when he actually goes about a deck, he goes and starts playing with the whites. He starts making these racist remarks just like others. He listens to their racist remarks on Coco Warnett and he laughs along with them. But this is something that starts hurting him because he's not really sure that this is the this is what he wants to be. But remember, 
what Foster is speaking about is this hypocrisy or this snobbery regarding what the white can do, what a black can do, or the prudishness of Mrs. March where she does not um, prudishness, the smugness of Mrs. March. All these are Victorian traits that, which are common Victorian traits that Foster is bringing to light. And by bringing to light these various Victorian traits, he starts uh, questioning and the reader starts questioning along with Foster as to was colonization justified because this culture is not necessarily superior to the other culture. There is a notion that you are trying to convey that one culture is far above the other. The European culture or the white culture is far better than the other because they were not bestial but then I mean you realize that even Mrs. March as Lionel tells Coco Vanet starts having a relationship with someone called Armstrong. That's what uh, Lionel tells Coconut that his mother to so uh, this relationship which is again something that's left ambiguous just like Victoria's relationship that Queen Victoria's relationship is um, not really spoken about directly but which is which are hinted in by various historians in a similar fashion we have Mrs. Marth's relationship that Foster hints at here the relationship that he, she had with Armstrong. Uh, he says he actually goes on to the extent where Lionel says that she found solace in the arms of Armstrong is how uh, Foster puts it uh, to an extent but then he quickly corrects himself saying that he's being just just nasty but the point that we have that here from from Foster is the notion of prudishness the, pr the notion of snobbery or smugness the kind of Victorian morality that is that was projected might be something that's just um, all about Victorian hypocrisy. Now this understanding of what was actually happening in the previous century and which the Victorians had used to justify their rule over the rest of the world the Victorian British uh, used to justify the rule is what Foster is really questioning here. And as a part of it he also is doing something else. He is also um, questioning what exactly this um, our, our understanding of various creatures come uh, happen here. Now what do we mean by this? Lionel, of course the name immediately harks back to what you term as the lion, the, um, the British emblem that you are speaking about. Whereas um, Coco Honet is someone who is described as someone who is almost like a monkey, an ape. Now there is um, and Coconut himself says that sometimes the, the the monkey has to teach the lion new tricks, has to show the lion the direction. And when he's seeing this and comparing himself to a monkey, there's always a notion that the lion is the king of the jungle. The lion is something that is a natural ruler. But while it's a natural ruler, it does not necessarily mean that it's all knowledgeable or it is some someone who is really smart or honest. And thus, uh, honest, and that's what uh, Coconut as well as Foster are trying to convey here. So that the symbols that they're using of a monkey that for Coconut suggest the the apian at uh, the way uh, the Orients had generally been viewed by the Occident as as looking like apes, as looking like like monkeys, whether these Africans or whether these are Asians, and by denigrating by terming these aboriginals are from Australia or any of these nations as, as being ape-like, what the uh, uh, um, the West had done, what the Europeans had done as justified ruling them. However, if they are apes, uh, for Foster, these are lions and the lions are not necessarily smarter than apes. That's the aspect that um, Foster says that if one is an animal, the other is an animal as well. It's not as if one is an animal and the other is human. Because bestial instincts exist in both the Europeans and um, and the natives as far Foster speaks. And these bestial instincts are normal is what Foster is trying to convey here. However, an, an aspect that Foster uh, throughout the story keeps suggesting and which is far more troubling is who exactly is Coco Vanette? 
coconut comes across as someone wily, someone who is, seems to have planned everything. One of the questions that people seem to have on a regular basis is, uh, how can coconut have everything in his um, control that he can actually get a letter back, that he can actually plan uh, to get a birth in the sense that he had turned to, and what was he actually planning? One of the one, critics has suggested, and Dorland, for instance, had spoken about this, and one thing that they have suggested, uh, and Silva as well, two things that we can get here is viewing Coco Vanat as a half brother to Lionel is a suggestion that has been put forth. Now, why is it that is put forth? It says that I mean, while is turned as half caste and the interest that Coco Annette has in what is happening, um, what had happened to Lionel's father is the one thing that actually interests people, that this is a kind of revenge that Coco Annette had planned. Maybe we don't know because this is a story that uh, Foster had not really given for publication. So there might be various elements that he did not really develop which he might have developed. The reason being that, I mean, uh, the reason why people consider that Coco Onet might be a half-brother of Lionel are, are many. One, first of all, why is Coco Onet actually traveling to England in the first place? Because the first question they start with, that Coco and Mrs. March then makes a statement right at the beginning of the story that I would have been far more troubled if we were actually traveling to India, but as we are traveling to England, I'm not all that worried. And the reason why she says that she's not all that worried is she feels that by traveling to England, they would have less opportunity to commune. Um, her children would have less opportunity to commune with coconut. But why did they anyway have any opportunity to commune with coconut? What was coconut doing on the boat in the first place, on the ship in the first place? These are questions that Foster never answers. Foster doesn't even answer as to who actually is accompanying Coco on it? I mean, where, does he have his mother, father, or someone who is taking him along? Or is it Mrs. March who is in charge of Coco on it as well? A question that we don't know. Um, so that our idea of who Coco on it is, his antecedents is by keeping it ambiguous, what Foster does is he encourages us to think about Coco on it as someone who was forced upon Mrs. March just like her children in that sense he becomes in one sense the child of her husband the child uh, of her husband and the and the Burmese lady that had gone away with which who she is actually accompanying to England and who she wants to have nothing more to do in that sense Coco Vanat is in one sense uh, trying to get his revenge on on Lionel by pulling him down to his level if we are talking about the European notion, European colonizers level as being higher, high, uh, the kind of hierarchy that they were just trying. If there was a hierarchy of, of that kind, it mean it would mean uh, that Coco Onet is trying to bring Lionel to his level, whether down up, whatever. But he's trying to bring him to his level. That's one thing that Coco Onet is trying to do. So this is suggestion. Um, and it goes further to the point where he keeps on the foster actually playing with words for instance in the later part of the story where he says um, Lionel's father has gone native Lionel's father has married a half caste Lionel's and then has given they probably has given birth to half caste that's the term that they use has married a Burmese woman and has must have given birth to half caste that's what Foster writes, and in the next sentence he says, the half-caste Coco Vanat did something, leading one to immediately start wondering, is he a similar half-caste or is it the same half-caste child that they are speaking about? But this is ambiguous. This is ambiguity that Foster deals with, and there is a reason for this ambiguity. I am not really convinced that uh, Coco Vanat is really a brother, a half-brother of Lionel. Even though Coco Onet wants to actually take him as his, as someone who works for him, as, as become uh, one of his employees. That's one of the things that Coco Onet actually offers Lionel. But this might seem like revenge, but for Coco Onet is in one sense, it can also be viewed as Coco Onet believes 
that Lionel need not worry about losing his job or losing his prestige among the whites because there would be an alternate existence which he does not need to frown upon. That there is always what you term as the other boat or the other world that you can actually move on to. Why should we keep on actually uh, trying to justify ourselves in this particular boat or in this particular culture or in this particular world or in this particular way of life but think about something where we can actually move, move to a different paradigm. The other boat then becomes another paradigm. We'll get to the boat metaphor in a minute but this ambiguity that um, Foster uses in, in the various scenes involving coconut makes him come across as what you term as the uncanny as something that 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 is uncanny now why do we call it uncanny uncanny not necessarily supernatural but in the european normative idea the victorian normative idea anything that did not fall into place or anything that did not uh, immediately become a part of what they termed as their logical rational structure something that they could easily explain because it it was a part of the kind of uh, probability that they were subscribing to what they term as the normative this probable structure anything that challenges it is is viewed by them as something that is supernatural and uncanny and this as wilson edmund wilson speaks of and uh, edward side of uh, uh, side to speaks of is mm, is how you view the Orient or how the Occident viewed the Orient as something that is mm, that is uncanny, something that dealt with the supernatural. So that the various things that Cocoa promises seem to have um, various suggestions of the uncanny. One of the things, of course, as we refer to the letter for one thing, but along with the letter there are these other notions that we have here the notions where he asks for a hairbrush and he says that i want it with all the hair left in the hairbrush now that seems as if as if he's going to practice voodoo or something but first it does not tell us that whether that coconut is going to practice voodoo it might just be that he wants these locks of hair from the brush so that he can keep them as keepsakes. That's one thing that uh, Foster suggests. Foster keeps this ambiguous mainly such, uh, telling us that the Europeans cannot understand how the other culture works. This is in similar way, uh, similar to how in passage to India, he does not exactly relate to us what happens inside the cave. And what happens inside the cave in passage to India is, all, is left ambiguous till the end. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's uncanny. It's because it is something that each culture would understand in a different manner. In the same way, here we are looking at each thing that happens in a different manner. Each one would understand this keeping of hairbrush. Or what happens after Cocovonet dies at the end of the story. When Cocovonet is murdered and his body is thrown into the sea. The natives were extremely interested in watching what would happen to the body. That's what the narrator tells us. And then they cheered when they found that his body was traveling against the tide, was uh, going against the tide. Now when it goes against the tide, it would suggest that he is a representative of the demon. That's how the, it is generally understood in your, in, when you speak about the supernatural and the uncanny. However, it might also mean that Cocoa Nut is someone who swam against the tide. He was a rebel. He was someone who was trying to live life as per uh, how he understood it, as per his own rules, rather than accepting societal rules. And the societal rules of heterosexuality in that sense did not really, um, were not something that Cocoa Nut accepted one. Secondly, he was not uh, accepting the European rule automatically. He is not someone who was willing to work for Europeans because he had the secretaries and his notion of how the world worked. Again and again, Coco through the story says, I will just give him a bribe and the work will get done. 
Lionel, while he has no issues, no qualms when they um, um, when he bribes his way into getting a birth or takes the help of Coco Bonnet to actually bribe someone, is scandalized, is shocked. He thinks that how can Coco Bonnet be so cunning, so cynical, and how can he always speak about bribes in such a manner? The question that Foster seems to ask is, if uh, we do not have a problem or being corrupt to get a uh, get a berth on a ship or something if we if the europeans are not really worried about this how can they actually start acting high and mighty about the various bribes that coconut is offering here in other words is saying that coconut comes across not as a hypocrite as lionel does coconut is someone who's far more straightforward well for the European way of life, we might say that the coconut comes across as wily, as his actions as, as something that uh, are circuitous, as uh, his behavior as something that's uncanny. If you under, if you look at it from coconut's perspective, Lionel comes across as a hypocrite, and Lionel's mother comes across as someone who is who behaves in a high and mighty manner, but if she is the representative of the empire, she is the representative of the queen, what happens to the British Empire is this, is that this uh, hypocrisy, this snobbery is something which would force them to go on to not only murder the native culture, in the sense coconut, if it's coconut is an allegorical figure, but also commit suicide to also spell a death knell for the British Empire in the sense that they go, Lionel goes and commits suicide. So that you are looking at the story from a perspective that unless there is proper appreciation of the other's culture, and it's not just about homosexuality here, but also about other's culture, unless you accept the other culture, unless you believe that there is more than one boat out there and we'll get back to the word just a minute uh, unless we accept this um, there are more than one cultures out there we don't need to get to the other to the point of the board by now i guess but still um, unless there's an acceptance of other boats in the world one of the problems that you'd have is it will only result in destruction of the native culture, in this sense coconut, the murder of coconut for instance, as well as the as, uh, death of the empire itself as represented by the suicide of uh, Lionel. Now, finally, let us quickly conclude with the autobiographical element and the boat. Two things. Mm, firstly, the autobiographical element, the story of course has a few uh, autobiographical elements that are woven into it. Foster himself had a relationship with uh, with a Muslim youth on one of his journeys and it did not really go work out as planned initially but later it was a relationship that Foster cherished and in one sense he's speaking about this relationship between and something that is dealt with with far more detail in Morris but this particular story this um, <coughs> in the other boat, the relationship between an English man and a native is in one sense harks back to that relationship that Foster had with the Muslim youth. No, that's one part of it. But far more significantly, uh, the question as to why Foster keeps insisting on calling it a boat, which of course most of them did. I mean, when you, when you look at these Raj narratives, these British Raj narratives, colonial narratives, one of the things that we would often see is they would speak about missing the boat, getting on the boat, and going on the boat. It, it was never a boat, it was always a ship naturally. But why would they insist on calling it a boat? Because the boat also in one sense, I contend, uh, how, um, refers to Noah's Ark. And Noah's Ark in the sense, the boat which actually becomes a representative of a certain culture here or a certain world, or a certain paradigm that you're speaking about, a certain view of life. So, well, it makes sense from Foster's view when he says that Lionel travels on the boat and then there is an other boat, the other boat being the boat that on, onto which he is invited by Coconut, the kind of life that he is 
he is almost he is seduced into being a part of and who he is shocked at what how he had actually betrayed his own boat in that sense and goes on to do whatever crimes that he finally does by committing murder committing suicide whatever so we are looking at the boat the other boat the title from that perspective now it, this is what foster is dealing with you can see how homosexuality for foster is not necessarily about something that is sensational that you want to bring into play but rather you are using this to question what you term as normal by foster's story as a part of 20th century british tradition you are viewing the story from a perspective where he is questioning the kind of normal or kind of worlds in which things are perceived as normal and how people uh, the empire had by creating a notion of what might be perceived as normal justified ruling over other worlds this normal did not just extend to to the various races to the other races where they are saying that they were hierarchically superior but even um, just a tidbit bit before we end even to the chalk circle that is drawn around mrs march right at the beginning of the story right in the first part of the story when a sailor draws this saying that there are certain places where women are not allowed suggesting again not just a racial divide but also a gender divide a gender hierarchy where where a so sailor a common sailor can decide on what whether um, in someone from the elite class if she's a woman can come to or not it also suggests how well queen victoria in one sense was telling the soldiers to do various things there are points where queen victoria could not really go there and check whether they are doing it she was not allowed into their barracks she did not have an inkling as to what exactly was happening in the barracks so that the kind of uh, snobbery or the kind of um, mindset that was present in the victorian era where they where their ignorance allowed them to think that they were morally superior to other races other cultures is something that foster is drawing upon remember when mrs march says that she does not have her valet with her the sailor does not even believe her he views her cynically he views her as a cheat which um in the light of what happens later in the story becomes significant because by viewing her almost as a cheat who is trying to uh, be really petty and not really wanting to pay for uh, for walking in a place where she is not generally allowed to uh, mrs marts um, is viewed as someone who the soldiers the sailors the other classes believe they can actually control believe that they have in one sense a power because mainly because of the kind of the gender superior supremacy that they felt which is again something that foster challenges through the story this along with the uncanny nature of the babe of the baby's death which in one sense seems to be attributed to some kind of voodoo that um kokovan had practiced is equally um is something that that is left ambiguous by foster for the simple reason that the reader can start questioning the story the other boat thus becomes something that uh, readers can keep going back to again and again and see as to what foster is doing with his ideas of imperialism his ideas on imperialism and how imperialism for foster comes across as something that is that is pathological the pathological and uh, which hurts not just the uh, other cultures but also english the english as well and that's what uh, we are trying to convey here thank you